morning and welcome to the Better People Podcast. I am Holly De Palma, and I am joined today uh, by Andrea Walton, who is the Chief People and Culture Officer at Bluebird Bio. She is also the founder of, Con- of the Concrete Rose Foundation, and uh, apparently that, those two don't keep her busy enough. She is also uh, an author, and her new book is published on Monday. Um, and I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Thank you for um, uh, joining us today, Andrea, and uh, welcome. Thank you, Holly, and thank you so much for the opportunity to come and discuss and have a great time. Um, really looking forward to the conversation today. Great. Um, So I want to start off with just sort of you sharing with us a little bit of your history um, to uh, becoming the chief people and culture officer at Bluebird, um, Bluebird Bio, and um, and a little bit just, you know, about the journey. I I love that your background includes, um, you know, a lot of uh, clearly personal perseverance and um, big company and maybe some smaller company and tell us all, tell us about the journey. Yes, absolutely. Um, my journey started back in, um, Ooh, long time. I'll just say a long time ago. Um, I started as a recruiter at a credit union in Pasadena, California, uh, a little over 20 years ago and, uh, got an opportunity because there was a woman who lifted me up and, you know, we're in women's history month. There are so many women that have come across my own personal and career journey that gave me an opportunity. And so Michelle Esser was the VP of HR at the time. Um, And I started to work in recruiting, did that for a few years. Uh, I was at Westcom, went to Coca-Cola, spent a couple, almost a couple of years at Coca-Cola as a recruiter, got an opportunity to go to Target um, because I wanted to expand my HR role and not just be a recruiter. And so in that role, I got to lead HR operations, uh, payroll, training, you name it. And it was in a retail environment. So it was like school of hard knocks, um, working day shift and overnight um, and did that for a couple of years. And then Nestle called me and uh, Nestle USA was based in Glendale, California at the time. I was in Southern California at the time and it just seemed like the right fit. And I just walked into the Glendale offices. and was like, this is exactly where I needed to be. And for almost eight years, right at eight years, I spent Uh, a good portion of my career learning everything HR from recruiting to uh, talent management, to being a generalist, to supporting uh, C-suite leaders and helping move uh, a little more than 300 employees from Southern California to Virginia, which is where I sit today. Uh, Did that. And then uh, I, I wanted to get into HR leadership. And so I had an opportunity to leave and go to EdTech. So that allowed me to kind of stretch my wings and get out of the CPG space and get into ed tech and went to 2U, which is based in Lanham, Maryland, um, as the vice president of HR uh, and was there uh, for almost two years there as well. Um, And then the opportunity that I've been working my entire career for came, which was chief people officer um, at uh, an ed tech company. Uh, And there is where I launched strategically diversity, equity, inclusion strategy, Uh, I was able to work across the executive team and partner with the board um, and then had an opportunity uh, not too long after. So I was there for about a year and a half. Um, And then Bluebird called me and I've never worked in biotech. And what's always driven me is purpose driven organizations. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I don't want to just go and do the work and collect a check. I want to be involved or making an impact in people's lives. And so I got an opportunity to come to Bluebird, uh, which is a curative gene therapy organization, um, and I've been at Bluebird for almost seven months. Um, and uh, they're based in Boston. I'm here in D.C., so I get up and down. But I've had an opportunity to almost work in every area of human resources, uh, and I've never backed down from an opportunity or a challenge to grow myself. Uh, and, and that's where I am today. Um, I read a little bit about Bluebird and uh, Bluebird Bio, and they do, you do um, like sickle cell research, right? To cure sickle cell? 
Yeah, so I'm not here to speak on behalf of Bluebird, but I will say that, yes, our focus right now is sickle cell uh, and gene therapy. I'll tell you, um, speaking of, you know, um, Women's History Month and yeah. and strong women and yeah. um, sort of um, the the power that we can help each other in organizations. Um, years ago, I the CEO of my of my organization was a woman whose uh, high school daughter had sickle cell, and oh I she um, her daughter had to move to Florida. Yeah. And we were in the Northeast. Yeah. And I just, that just, I was like, yeah, that broke my heart and the strength of that individual. And, yes. and I just th thought when I, when you're talking about your, your background, yeah. um, just wanted to tie that in. And, you know, yes. certainly it's a um, mission driven organizations really do um, bring about something different in the workplace for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so talk to me, I love the, uh, the, the journey and the large company, um, mm -hmm. especially like recruiting. I also started in recruiting, like, so, like so back in the day, well, I, I was back in the day when we put ads in newspapers. So, yes. uh, <laughs> like oh, you say so. that to young kids now and they're like, <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> um, they're like, what's a newspaper anyway. Um, so I'd love to, you know, talk to me about the 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 difference that you've had from a cultural perspective um from large company to to small company and what might have you um brought with you but also mm -hmm. said i didn't like that about big company and i want to make yeah. sure we have this here you know that's such a great question because unintentionally but it worked out is that as i ascended in my career the smaller the companies have gotten. And, um, you know, I started at the big CPG companies, as I mentioned, and I love, you know, at the beginning of my career, I loved it because I love the structure that was already put in place with the large companies. I love that there was a, uh, the ability to work across large teams and learn so much from different leaders, not just nationally, but globally. I mean, that's, one of the things I just loved about Nestle, you know, the Nestle had sent me to have a Switzerland for HR training. I got to meet HRs from every part of the world. And I so embraced that. Um, but, you know, on the flip side, I think when it comes to larger companies, you can also sometimes and no, no dig on Nestle, but just overall lose touch. And what I love about the smaller uh, organizations that I've worked for is that you get to know everyone. You get to know who sits where. You get to know their names, their families, what motivate them. And so as much as large companies were really my foundation, I have come to really appreciate um, uh, the proximity that smaller companies give you when it comes to culture and, and, and culture building and team building uh, with our employees. Yeah, I, I that really resonates with me. I I started my career at a very large um, university um, yeah. as a recruiter, and I used to say, and this is, uh, you know, we we weren't using the word culture back then. We weren't even using the right. word HR, right? The right. phrase HR. It was, it was like personnel. personnel. Right? Yes. Yeah. And I used to say, I feel like I can walk around campus, and there are people here. We were so big. Yeah. That I said, I, I felt like there were people here who don't know what we do, don't know what our mission is. And you can get sort of lost. But when you're, um, but yet, what an opportunity to get exposure in so many different areas and opportunity to learn from so many different people. Um, but then working in a smaller organization, it's it's um, a, a real need to be committed to the mission in those organizations. Yes, yes. I mean, you know, our team now is so committed just to culture and our patients and the work that we do. So, um, you know, I, again, large companies, whether it was Target or Nestle, uh, there's still a great mission, right? Nestle is to feed, you know, so many people around the world and Target to be a, a great large retailer. But there's something about that proximity uh, and the mission where I am now that just resonates with me. Yeah. So tell me about where you are now and the the culture that you've um, um, 
brought been brought in to to build and to maintain and and what are some of the what are some of the um sort of strategies that you have used to do that you know i really had to take a step back and um you know when i first got on board it was my primary mission was just to shut up and listen <laughs> and ask questions and what worked what didn't mm-hmm. um what made what makes this company uh, so great that you're like, I'm here and I'm here for the long run. And it's really to amplify and evolve that, not revolutionize it. And so um, when I came on board, it was after having kind of these intakes, was then structuring my own team to make sure that we could support the work that was uh, needing to be done. And then looking at our values and our mission and making sure that the work that comes through people and culture uh, amplifies that as well. Then we looked at our DEIB strategy and how can we make sure that that is not something that we just say, but is actually in the work that we do. And so really revitalizing that with uh, KPIs and targets to hold us accountable to who we recruit, where we recruit, how we recruit, uh, holding us accountable to our internal steering committee who can oversee this work, uh, providing data on a regular basis because I, I want us to be able to use data and insights to help us know how we're closing gaps when it comes to women and underrepresented groups in the organization. So really just taking a hard look, create and looking at our mission and values and creating strategy uh, and vision that allows us to then start to do the work to bring us closer to where we want to get. Yeah, I I love that you mentioned DEIB work. We um, So first of all, when I first heard the B added to DEI, I was like, yeah. Yes. The yes. belonging piece yes. is what is that that what ties it all together, Huge. right? Huge. Is that yes. I feel like I belong here. Um yes. is is yeah. a really powerful addition to the 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 statement. Absolutely. Um, um I'd love to, you know, our listeners are typically uh, mid-market HR and I'd love to understand who are who are, you know, tasked with this, tasked mm-hmm. with putting together um, uh, a DEIB strategy. Tell me, you know, if you can get a little granular for me. Yeah. You mentioned yeah. um, KPIs and steering committee and yeah. making yeah. sure that we're, t- tell me, you know, and you're in a, you're in a biotech field, which is not necessarily thought of as an extreme um, uh, diverse field. I mean, could be in high tech. Yeah, it's true. (laughs) It's true. I mean, there's a level of granularity, um, that you have to get to wherever you work to decide with the leaders, with your team, where are our gaps? Mm -hmm. Let's just start there. We know where we are uh, in biotech that people of color that's that's an obvious gap. And then when we drill down more, African-American, Latinx. And so what we've done is created APIs and targets to help us close gaps specifically around those groups. So when it comes to talent acquisition, we've just partnered with uh, a great organization to help us launch our, our, in our first formal internship program that focuses on people of color because I want us to build an organic pipeline of entry level folks that are that can grow into the organization. Then we look at retention and development. Uh, our organization now is equitably paying people of color at a rate even higher than white men. And so we want to make sure that from a retention perspective, that we're paying folks uh, market and, and what they deserve. We're promoting. Uh, and creating opportunities within the organization. So having succession plans with diverse Mm -hmm. employees on them, having regular conversations around development of diversity within everyone, but especially diversity within the organization and being intentional about it. It it is those very practical, intentional steps that we are taking to not only talk about how to increase it, but actually do it. And then I've created in partnership with my director of people ops uh, an HR analytics dashboard. And what this is helping us do is track attrition of everyone, but including those groups that we know we have opportunities. 
uh, looking at exit service data, uh, exit survey data, look in our engagement survey, our engagement survey we just did last quarter, 78%, which is amazing for biotech and made amazing for our space. Uh, and then within that, diverse groups saying that they are engaged, but also gave us some really great feedback on how to turn those things around. So we talk about steps, actual literal things. Those are the things we're doing. And then in addition, you know, having our ERGs that have internal programming as well as external community outreach uh, to continue to have engagement. So it is all of those, and I'm sure I'm missing some, but very granular steps to help then be intentional about not only increasing, developing, and then promoting and having successors that reflect the communities that we serve. Yeah, you mentioned um, succession plans and bringing yeah. people in sort of, I'm going to use the term with like a career ladder. Yes. Um, and, you know, talk to me about that because that is something that so many of the organizations with whom I work really struggle with in terms of it's not always just being a manager, right? It's not it's not that you come in and you do this job and then you manage people that do this job. Talk to me about the development opportunities and some sort of creativity within that because everybody can't come in and then all of a sudden get promoted to run. That's right. That's right. I mean, listen, you know, you're absolutely right. There can only be so many people on succession, but you can develop everybody, right? And so mm -hmm. it is about creating depth and breadth of experiences. It's not just succession, that's a part of it, but what type of developmental programming are you establishing within your organization? So even if you've got someone that's an individual contributor, but you can create depth and breadth in their role, or you can give them cross-functional opportunities to help develop them, that is how you start to broaden how you think about it. And that's how we're thinking about it. It's not just a, a few folks that are going to sit on our COO succession. That's fantastic. But you've got a, a few hundred other employees, or we call them birds because we're bluebird birds, that are looking for opportunity. Yeah, are looking for opportunities to develop in their career. And so having conversations with your employee one-on-one -on -one about where they see themselves, where they want to go. We know, not just from where I work now, but just in my career, you know, a lot of companies still do that nine box. You know, I've heard some people that are for it, some people that are against it. But regardless, most of the time when you do it, 60 or 65% of your employee base ends up in that middle box. Those are the folks that do the work, that grind it, that you need, that you can't overlook. They're not going to be in that top 20, 15, 20%. Most of your organization is going to be in that in that middle. So how are you developing that group? They may not want to be an asset. They not, may not want to be a high pope. They are so good being a, an amazing sustained performer. We need to start looking at ways to develop sustained performance um, and continue to uh, evolve that that group. I'll tell you, I, I I love the phrase sustained performance. I was a HRD. I was a terrible HRD, but I was an HRD and I had a, a, a woman who worked for me and did, um, you know, HRIS and payroll and benefits administration. And she was very, very good there. And, and, and when she sent an email or she sent any kind of uh, notification, people responded. Like it, it was really wow. um, remarkable. And um and we were, as an organization, talking about succession and talking about development. And I was speaking with her about, uh, about opportunities to develop and to, you know, sort of move into potentially other roles. And she looked at me and said, you don't understand. I like what I do. Yes. And I don't want to yes. do. And I thought excuse me, I was like, wow, what a self-awareness moment for me yes. where I was putting sort of my thoughts of wanting to be this and wanting to do that on to what she must be wanting. And she was like, let me be clear. This is That's the right. actual job I want. And I'm going to say, she said to me, I'm a mother of two little boys. 
Mm-hmm. And my husband works full time in this job. I have the flexity to X, Y, and Z. And I'm really, really happy to do that. That's and right. I'm really, really happy doing this. And so, I mean, this was years ago. And this is a great lesson now for really meeting people where they are. And I wanted to sort of um, segue into that as that is your um, really, I might have just rearranged what the focus of your book is, but but really, um, you know, talk to me about your your passion there around sort of um, wellness and well-being for yes. Yes. Well, I love that she was clear with you. Like, look, that's great. Yeah. But this and is you know what? It's 20 years later. She's yes. she's doing the job at yes. a different place, but she's like, I'm still happy as a clam. That's and, right. and that's right. That's right. Meet people where they are. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, my my book, All the Smoke, um, is really a story, a personal and professional story about how I've navigated my career and dealing with being in an abusive marriage for eight years. And when you talk about meeting people where they are, this is why I have such a heart and empathy for employees to bring their whole selves to work because I understand the need to try and figure out this work-life balance. I think I mentioned to you earlier, I don't believe in work-life balance anymore. I believe in work-life integration because it's impossible, I think, to be able to do both 100% all the time. There's just no way. Um, You know, I would show up to work with my own trauma, trying to navigate taking care of my son and my daughters in a home that felt unsafe while leading organizations as an HR leader and having to put on a face so I can be successful. And thankfully, I was able to still operate and perform, but what a balance that was for so many years. And so when we think about creating space where people, you can meet people where they are, and uh, that means making sure that like from a total rewards perspective, that you have mental health uh, resources, that you provide PTO and kind of ways that folks can have flexible time. Because, you know, you may have a sick parent, you may have sick kids, you may need to be at soccer practice. It may not be as serious as abuse, but it is the ability to have a life that extends beyond the walls or the virtual walls of the work that you do. And and that's important. So first of all, I, you know, I want to respond to, um, you know, the, the horrible situation of being in an abusive um, marriage and um, the strength that you obviously have um, to um, have over gotten out of that and overcome it and be as successful as you are. So I want to recognize that, but you made a comment and, um, you said, um, you know, worrying and and being, you know, worried about your children and your, yourself and your health and your situation and showing up to work. Right. And I'm just sort of thinking out loud here, but my, my thought went to, Showing up to work for some people is not leaving that situation because of the virtual nature of work. Yes. And the devastation of that kind of situation where you used to be able to leave, but now, you you know, I mean, some people aren't back in offices, right? And it's not necessarily a choice. That's right. That's right. And, um, And I just sort of got a wave of like, oh. Yes. I mean, what what a, we know from the, the, the statistics that during the pandemic, domestic violence actually increased. Um, and and we also know that when a woman decides to leave, and there are men in those situations too, that when a woman decides to leave, that's the most dangerous time for her to leave. And mm-hmm. so to your point, um, the pandemic really brought a lot of that ugliness up to the surface for a lot of people. Yeah, um, sure did. And I'm sure there are some who will probably watch this and they experience that through the pandemic. So thankfully, we are not uh, quarantined anymore because for me, in my situation before the pandemic, it actually allowed me some escape. And it allowed me to, um, I, I mentioned in my book, when I would leave home, 
I would excel. I would take a deep breath. I was able to be myself within the work walls because I could forget about that for a while. And, and I actually excelled during that time because I felt like I felt joy. I felt like, right. oh, yes, I need to be here. I love this work. I love the people I work with. And when I would go home, I would pull in the garage, hold my breath, and then go into the house. And so um, thankfully, we're not quarantining anymore before anyone. And I hope we can put some resources up at the end for any woman or man dealing with uh, any type of domestic abuse situation. Um, you do not not have to be in that at all. And there's resources to help. Yeah, yeah, powerful, um, certainly powerful discussion. I want to, um, um, I want to sort of uh, end with a question around um, future of work. What do you, you know, we were coming out of the pandemic and um, sort, sort, I get, I think. I know, are we? <laughs> Are we? In, we're doing like a cha cha, <laughs> right? Um, and you know, lots of employers are wrestling with um, work from home, yeah. not work from home. We want to maintain flexibility, but we want to make sure our people are collaborating, and and it's a real challenging time for organizations and leaders and organizations around making decisions. What do you, what do you anticipate, or what do you see if you had a crystal ball? What do you, what do you think might? Yeah. Um, great question and, and very timely because we're, we're all talking about it still. Um, if I had a crystal ball, I'd say that we will continue to be hybrid. Um, our organization and what I'm focused on culturally is more experienced focused hybrid work. So I'm remote. I sit in the D.C. area. We've got folks that sit in and around the corporate offices. We have employees in 26 states. Um, folks come in and we call them anchor days where there are executive team members in the in the office. They will come in for that or we have team members coming for town halls, it is still very flexible. And we haven't been prescriptive because our engagement of our team is more important than saying, be in on these days. Uh, our team is getting the work done. We have lab birds that actually have to be in the lab. Uh, so it's harder for them to be hybrid, but we're figuring it out. And I'd say from a crystal ball perspective, it'll continue to be this, but be more clear about what flexible work means, what hybrid work means. Um, but our team's happy and engaged, and that's what that's what makes me happy. Awesome, awesome. Well, again, Andrea, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, meet you first of all and talk with you. And I'm looking forward to uh, your your book being published. And as I said, folks, walk, don't run to look at the cover of this book. It is it it really it's uh, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful cover, and. Um, mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to enjoy um, picking it up. So thank you, thank thank you very you much, much again for your time. Thank you for listening. We hope you got a ton of value out of this episode. Before we go, we want to thank the sponsor of our show, the Mid-Atlantic Employers Association, more commonly referred to as MEA. MEA provides human resources services to hundreds of businesses across numerous industries every day, bridging gaps that restrain innovation and growth. If you need support around people issues, reach out to meainfo.org. Better people, better outcomes.